Good afternoon, Lighthouse family. What a privilege it is for us to join together at this special time on Good Friday as we remember the last hours, the last day of the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ as He bore our burdens, as He went to the cross for us and won for us the victory that only He could win and bring to us all of the gifts and the renewal that only He could so I invite you to join us this afternoon, set aside any distractions, get a Bible if you will, uh, if you don't have one with you, and if you will, go ahead and prepare in whatever way works for you, uh, bread and juice, because we'll be sharing communion together very shortly at the, en at the end of this service. So join us, enter in as we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you in these few minutes. Uh, this is my first recording ever, and because of that, I want to actually read the ether thoughts that I had. When I was a young Krishna, I always cried when I read the Easter story, especially that Jesus had to die this horrible death. And just imagine the pain, which I think we cannot fathom until we go through ourselves. It also did not, I also did not understand why God, his Father, did not intervene. He listens to our prayers and many times diverts the situations into our favors. Over the years, I learned much about the real meaning of why Jesus had to get through this awful death, but it still took time before I could grasp the whole meaning and truth about it. Of course, soon I realized that Jesus had come for this very reason, as we all know, to die this death on the cross to fulfill the redemption plan of the Father. It shows me how much the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are for each one of us, especially that Jesus said yes to this plan. Why did Jesus have to die such a horrible death and in that time? It was first because God knows the right time of his plan, and the death on the cross was the most horrific one in Roman times. In fact, after Jesus' time, this was abolished. And the second reason, much more important, why this violent dying was to show the world how terrible sin is to God. A holy God simply cannot stand and accept sin. As he wants fellowship with us humans and to reconcile the whole world back to God again, he had to use an innocent person, and that was his only begotten son, Jesus. Jesus died for every one of us, but it's up to us to recognize and accept it. When I said in the beginning that I cried because Jesus had to die such an awful, tremendous, painful death, I have now tears in my eyes because the sheer thankfulness of the sheer thankfulness that he did it for me. It makes me want from the heart to really please him in every way. He truly deserves all gratefulness, glory and honor. Have a blessed Easter. the 
but the blood of Jesus, this is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus, glory, glory, this I see, nothing but the I just want to read to you uh, Mark 8, verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The way of the cross. It's so easy for us to remember and say it's Good Friday and know that Jesus died on the cross. But it's not easy for Jesus as a man. We sometimes uh, neglect and more often uh, take for granted the meaning of the cross. We naturally like to escape trial, shame, and rejection. But Jesus Christ obediently and sacrificially received and suffered for our sake to fulfill God's promise. So as we wait for the Lord's coming, glorify God in everything we do. Share the love of Jesus in action and in prayer. Continue to walk in the path where the Lord wants us to go and serve Him only. Let us not forget to be grateful for what He has done in our life and for everything that we receive every day. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and thank you for the eternal life. Amen.
Hello everyone at Lighthouse. I've been asked to uh, put a few thoughts together on uh, the events that led up to Jesus' uh, last few days with us here on earth almost 2,000 years ago. And um, I, I think of all the things that happened uh, in those last days, the uh, one of the things that really um, sort of impacted me or, or, or sticks in my mind is uh, when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. I think of other things like the sacrifice he made and the Last Supper and, and the prayers. And, and I always think, yes, I could, you know, we think in our hearts, yes, we could do that. Just like Peter said, you know, yes, I won't deny you. And yes, I could do those things. And we might be strong enough to do those things. Um, for me, the, the one thing that's always uh, been the hardest to, to, to understand and to see uh, what Jesus did was when he washed the feet of the disciples. Um, I think of myself, I know we all have different skills and different qualities and, and some things we do like doing and some things we don't. I mean, uh, I love washing the cars, absolutely love it. And I love taking the wheels off and getting all dirty and mucky and grimy. Um, but Rose, and uh, she didn't definitely didn't enjoy washing the car. Um, and I know other people don't, so it's, it's not their cup of tea um, and they don't get any sort of joy from that. But, um, but there's, I think there's things that we, we are happy to do and we have a limit and we say okay this is what I, I can do that but I won't do anything you know I'm not going to do that that I won't do and for me I always uh, find it hard to to under you know the washing of, of, of people's feet especially men's feet I mean dirty feet as well it's something that I've always struggled to think oh no why did the you know why did uh, why did Jesus have to do that and he did it to set the perfect example for us um, I hope and pray one day that I will be uh, strong enough to be able to do something that sounds as simple as that, but in reality to to find something and to go and do it in such a level of servitude as that um, is, is uh, uh, it's not just washing your feet, it's what was in his heart. And that's beyond, uh, be, uh, well, can potentially be beyond any of us, I think. Um, so uh, yet again, Jesus sets us the perfect example of what to do. You know, if there's ever any doubt as to how we should do something, uh, look to Jesus because almost certainly he's just like the bracelets. What would Jesus do? He's set the perfect example for us to follow and no one else has ever done anything better than that. So um, yeah, we always look to Jesus and try and follow him and be a, the, the, the best we can do as we hopefully become more like Jesus as we lead on uh, in our Christian lives. Uh, have a blessed Good Friday, everyone. God bless you. Jesus loves you. Bye. Run to the cross. Oh, go to the cross and make the exchange. Give him your wounds. He has taken your pain, taken your sickness, his health you may gain. He took on your sin, his righteousness came, and with his blood he covered your shame. Making you white, removing the blame, he was rejected, so you'd be accepted. Accepted by God in his family plan. With God as your father and love that will stand, oh, just for you, he became poor, born in a stable and stripped at the cross. Struck and impoverished, he suffered your loss, but you were made rich by the love at the cross. He died your death, he gave you his life. How you like house family? Uh, it's been a while, I am fine and hope uh, you are also doing well. Uh, I think we all know what is going on these days, uh, especially with this COVID-19 uh, that changed the whole world's ways of living, uh, of thinking and seeing things. Uh, we are losing our loved ones, many are dying, many are suffering. Uh, there is fear and worry everywhere. And we may wonder what to do. Uh, we see in 
Luke 22, verse 44, uh, what Jesus did when uh, he was uh, in his agony. It said, when Jesus uh, began uh, to have troubles in his mind, he prayed again and even more strongly. And I believe that is what we can do. Pray again and again and even more strongly. So let us look at our problems, our circumstances and situations uh, like the Red Sea and uh, pass through it uh, as on uh, dry land, not only by praying, uh, but also by faith in Jesus because he died for our sins and he rose again victoriously. See you very soon. Bye. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Sabbath, then to the twelve. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I know lives in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. Till on that cross as Jesus 
We want to look at scripture for just a few minutes this afternoon, so I hope you will take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Uh, these are This chapter is about the Last Supper. All of the Gospels mention something about it, but we're going to be looking in Luke 22. And if you have bread and juice, get that ready because in just a few minutes we will share communion together on this Good Friday afternoon whenever you are joining us, whether it's right now or whether you'll be joining us later. And I want to ask you a question uh, as, we look at, as we look at this Last Supper of Jesus and His disciples. What are things that you anticipate with eagerness? And what are things that you dread 
uh, all of us can mention things that we look forward to. It may be a holiday coming up, or it may be the time when we don't have to wear masks anymore. Won't we be happy when that happens, Who, whenever that is? Uh, I think all of us would probably say, yes, I dread this and I dread that. I don't know about you, but for me, when I know I have a dentist visit coming up, and I'm very grateful for dentists, I usually have some dread uh, in my heart when I'm going to the dentist. But we want to look at Luke 22 with that in mind, and I want to read to you from uh, verse 14 and a few verses following as we look at this Passover meal and then at the juice and the bread that Jesus specifically shares with his disciples at the end of the meal because it's actually two different things. We usually put it together. Most of us have some understanding and some background of the Passover meal and we all know that the Passover meal that every Jewish family celebrated was something that looked back to what had happened when they were slaves in Egypt, when their ancestors were slaves in Egypt, and God told them, I'm going to deliver you with a mighty hand. But that deliverance would come through God's judgment on Egypt, on all of Egypt, on all the households of Egypt, whoever was living there. And so the Passover, as we know, happened when the angel of God passed over every house of Israel that had taken a spotless lamb and had killed it and had taken the blood and then put the blood on the doorposts and over the mantle of the door. And when the angel of the Lord saw the blood, he passed over that house and he went to other houses and ju the judgment of God fell on the households that did not have the blood applied to the door. And we already know the rich symbolism of that. And so Jewish families would gather on this night. This is one of the most important feasts and gatherings, religious gatherings of every Jewish family. And Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. And we read in verse 14, when the hour came, the hour for them would have been uh, by around 6 p.m. in the evening, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And to me, when I look at these words of Jesus, I am a little bit surprised because the Passover meal is not something that I would look forward to knowing what it would usher in in the few hours ahead. His suffering, his betrayal, uh, his, his trial, his mockery, his crucifixion, his, his separation from God as he bore all the sins of the world, your sins and my sins. And yet Jesus says to his disciples, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why does Jesus eagerly desire to eat this Passover? And we find in the next verse, in verse 16, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And so we have here Jesus not looking back any longer as all Jewish families would when they celebrated the Passover, but Jesus was looking at it as the very last Passover meal he would ever take part in. And instead of looking back to what had been in the past, 1,500 years or hundreds of years earlier, he instead is looking forward. And he says, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So let's pause and think about that for just a few minutes. Because Jesus knew what they did not know. And Jesus knew that the Passover they celebrated in honoring and remembering the mighty deliverance that God had wrought on their behalf over Egypt and over the cruel hand of Pharaoh was only a shadow of the real deliverance that was to come. And it was to come through his suffering and his sacrifice. And so for Jesus, rather than looking back, Jesus is looking ahead. And he says, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment 
in the kingdom of God. What did Jesus mean when he said that? Well, if we look all the way over at Revelation 19.9, one short verse, in Revelation 19.9, we read the words that the angel told John the Beloved to write. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. And so when we go back to Luke and we look at the words that Jesus uttered on that night and he said, this is the last time I'm going to eat this Passover meal, it will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What that tells us is the Passover is a shadow. The Passover meal is not reality. The fulfillment is yet to come. Jesus knew that his suffering and the cross were yet ahead. But even that he would move beyond that and its final fulfillment for him and for us would lie yet ahead at some point in the future when he is in heaven, when you and I are in heaven and we are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we are invited because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ you and I have an open invitation that we can anticipate that one day, perhaps not that long in the future, you and I will be at another table and another supper, at another meal, not looking back any longer, but fulfilling what Jesus said is coming. And that will be the wedding supper of the Lamb. And what Jesus meant then, and what these words mean to us now, is the time is coming when because of the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our lives, which are appropriated, the, the blood and the body broken, appropriated in our lives, that we in intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ will enjoy fellowship forever symbolized in this very real supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb. We will be ready. We will be in fellowship with Him. Jesus knew what was coming, and He said, I'm doing this now for its fulfillment in what is yet ahead. Isn't that wonderful to think of that this afternoon when we eat the bread and when we drink this juice in just a few minutes? Jesus was eating this meal for the very last time. And for Jesus, he was going to be over and done with this. It was taken care of. It was handled. It was paid for. It was going to be finished. So that, in looking ahead, you and I might be eternally in perfect and intimate fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven forever. And we see that in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Isn't that encouraging this afternoon? After he said these words, then look with me at verse 17. He said, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. At this point, Jesus is still talking about the Passover meal. This is these, these various cups and the food. It was part of the Passover meal. Part of the Passover meal was the lamb that had been slain. Uh, and, and Jesus knew that that meant his body that, had been, that was to be broken for them. And so they were to take it and to eat it as a symbol, though they did not yet know it, of the sacrifice of Jesus being appropriated in their lives and being applied to their lives and being applied to the sin that was part of their lives and part of our lives as well. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And Jesus knew this was what was ahead. And then it comes to the part that you and I are preparing to take part in. And we read it in verse 19. And it says, And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he 
broke it. It would have looked something like this, except probably a much bigger flat loaf. This would have been customary. And then he broke it and he gave it to each one of them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And what we see here, brothers and sisters, is no, is no longer part of the Passover meal that for them was looking back to what, what God had done in Egypt. But Jesus was instituting His meal, His supper for you and for me. And with the breaking of the bread and the giving it to His disciples and saying that this was His body that was broken for them and for you and for me, He was instituting the age of grace. Hallelujah. No longer under the law, but in the age of grace, the sins of all the world would be paid for. And that is why we read, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we confess our sins and He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we read after that, in verse 20, in the same way after the supper, He took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And this is the cup that we drink, when we remember this Last Supper, when Jesus says, do this until I come again. And so we also very briefly look back at his sacrifice, but even more, we look ahead to the time when he comes again for us and he will bring us to hev heaven. And the supper that we will then celebrate is no longer that piece of bread that was his body broken, that cup that was his blood shed. But at the wedding supper of the Lamb, oh, brothers and sisters, you and I will be seated at a table with all the saints of all the ages who have died in faith and have gone to heaven. And we will be in fellowship from every tri tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language. And we will be forever with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, we want to right now do what the Lord Jesus said. And we want to take of this bread that represents his body that's been broken for us. And we want to eat together this afternoon, on this Good Friday afternoon. Shall we eat together? And then we take the juice and the cup that represents his blood that is shed for us. Shall we drink together? And Jesus, we do this until you come again. We hope it will be very soon. We long for your coming. We look for your coming. We are waiting for your wedding supper in heaven when we will be with you forever, redeemed by your blood, healed fully because of your broken body for us. Hallelujah. We worship you, our Lamb of God, slain for us. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to join us as we worship the Lord this afternoon. Let's sing together, Worthy is the Lamb. Bearing all my sin and shame
God bless you again, Lighthouse family. What a privilege it has been to gather with you online and worship together and remember our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.